That's right. Good afternoon. How's everybody doing today? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so this is Lectures or Life Lessons, Security Awareness Training that works. My name is Cindy Jones, otherwise known as Cinders and Ashes. And I'm Megan Wu, aka Totem Cough. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go through our presentation and then at the end what we would like to do is not only open it up to questions, but also open it up for you guys to share success stories of your own for user awareness program. Um, because something that we're going to hit on a lot today is the fact that we need to do more sharing about what works versus what doesn't work. Because we're hearing a lot about the negatives, right? We're inundated by blog posts, tweets, news stories, all that kind of stuff saying user awareness training doesn't work, right? And we leave it at that. It doesn't work. Well, why doesn't it work? Is it because our users are stupid? Well, no, that's what a lot of us brush it off as, but that doesn't get to the root cause. What we need to do is take it a step further and think, okay, is it because um, our training methods are boring, right? Maybe annual computer-based training isn't good enough. Uh, what if we're not doing uh, posters or newsletters? Would that interest them? Would it not interest them? We don't have this information. So that's what we would like to see as part of a holistic and comprehensive user awareness training program. Okay? And then we want to take it a step further from that and not just give them the training and the information, but we want to help them build out habits. So how do we do that? How do we create that feedback loop so that they see um, a condition happen and they perform the right action or the action that we, you know, will get the most favored response? Uh, okay, so <clears throat> we're, high, we're mostly leveraging annual computer-based training, right? For the most part, that's what we use. Uh, or maybe sometimes we'll give them our InfoSec policy when they first get hired, and then that's it, okay? So let's start by looking at some success and failure stories that we commonly see. All right, so we're most common with the failures, or we're most familiar with the failures, rather. Okay, so uh, let's start with a story on phishing from Cindy. Oh, excuse me, so this is a very personal story. Um, I. Recent, I, a couple of years ago, I started with an organization, and about two weeks into the job, you know when you're just starting off and your role isn't super well defined, and you're getting the emails, and you're there, and you're anxious, and you're excited to be there, and you get that email on a Saturday, and it's from a VP, and that's kind of cool, and you're looking at it on your phone, because you're not going to be on the computer, you're with your family. Looking at it on your phone, it's like, hey, I need you to take a look at this document. We are selecting a few people who want to get feedback on some organizational changes. Oh, cool. All right. I'm not sure what my job is. Click. Creds. Flashing red lights. You have just been pwned. This is your ni biggest nightmare, right? So this is exactly what happened to me a week and a half into coming into Rapid7. Failed a phishing test completely. This happens all the time. I don't know how many times you all have failed them, but, you know, it happens. It was really well done. It just happened. When you're on mobile, you don't see the email address, etc. It was... Uh, Full disclosure, I did go ahead and tell my manager immediately after that. I said, hey, just so you know, fail this thing. So, heads up. So, phishing's very common. We also do social engineering based trainings, right? But we never report that information back. So, it doesn't really hit home how important it is. So, another thing that happens would be tailgating, right? So, when I'm a smoker, I spend a lot of time out in smoking areas. I think that's probably where I've talked to a lot of, well, not necessarily a lot of you guys, but I know I've talked to some of you guys out in the smoking areas of very co various cons and things. Um, I also, I'm at client sites quite often. I go out there and I'm hanging out and I'm smoking and just chatting with people in general because I'll talk to just about anybody. And as you're talking to folks, have a badge, don't have a badge, it doesn't really matter. I've got my water bottle in one hand, I've got a cigarette, you know, my cigarette pack in the other. They're going to hold the door for me because people and just they want to be nice, right? They let you in the door. I cannot think of a single client site that I've been at where I haven't managed to get into the door, ever. That's just the way it is. Whether I've gotten into the restricted areas, have I tried? Has it been that type of an engagement? Not necessarily. But that initial letting you in the building it happens every single time. And sometimes that's enough because, so 
If we hop in the way, way back machine, when I first started in IT and tech, one of my first jobs was doing uh, tech support for a, um, what are they called, like a CPA, but a huge tax company. I don't want to like say their name on recording. <laughs> but basically what we would do is we would go in, we would upgrade their um, operating system, install patches, make sure that everything's set to default so that way when the new tax folks come in, it's all there ready to go. So what a lot of people don't realize is when you go into one of these offices, these satellite offices, you sit down with your tax person, they put in your information, and then they send it to a server that's in the back room, and it holds all of that information for about a week or so until it runs a batch and sends that information to the central server over in the HQ. So sometimes stuff happens and the server needs to be rebooted and you need to enter a complex password for um, BitLocker, right? Well, they in every single office, they had that password taped to the monitor of that server. So as soon as you enter it, you can see everybody's tax information from that week since the last batch job went. So we need to explain to them not only that it's bad, but why it's bad and what they can do to fix it. So it's, you know, that's just one of dozens of stories that we all have, you know, for failures when it comes to user awareness training. So let's talk about some of the successes. Um, so did you want to talk about your consultants first? Oh, sure. Yeah. So we were talking a little bit about the tailgating thing um, and the being in the right place where you're the appropriate place for your role within or from outside of an organization. Um, I previously to my current employer, I worked for a, it's a small little boutique pen testing play, uh, shop down in uh, San Antonio. And I'd been on the job for about three weeks. I was pretty comfortable there. Um, I had met my coworkers enough to feel comfortable walk, wandering around the office. Like I said, I talked to everybody. So I was uh, just kind of getting in the mode. And a couple of the guys who had been out on assignment for a few weeks came in and didn't recognize me. And they see me wandering around the office talking to various people. I literally got pinned up against the wall by the two of them. They hadn't been there for about three weeks, the entire length of my employment. And like, who are you? Let me see your badge. Who's your boss? What's your position? I got the third degree. Had I not been working for an information security company, I might have seen that as a little bit obtrusive. As it was, I was like, cool, right on. Something's working here. The message is getting across. These guys who were junior consultants for the most part were still able to reiterate that the the lessons that we've been taught and that we live every day. We hear this stuff every single day. We live this stuff. And even so, there's still failures at the fishing thing. But you know, the point is they were able to go ahead and just, without being abusive in any way, but they were very assertive in finding out who I was if I actually belonged there. Right, and so hopefully they got some sort of commendation for that because we need to have more positive reinforcement for our users when they do stuff right. So. Uh, my last place of employment, I did PCI QSA stuff. So I was with that annoying person who was like, show me your controls. <laughs> so we were doing the physical walkthrough to make sure that people were badging in, that I couldn't just plug into a jack and access something important. And while we were walking around, I was walking with a CISO um, of a major retailer. He stopped mid-tour, saw that someone was actually following the clean desk policy. Their machine was locked. Their whiteboard was wiped down and there was nothing on their desk. So what they did was, as soon as we got back from the tour, he sent an email out to the department saying, hey, so-and-so did a really good job following the clean desk policy. I just want to give him a shout out. And that sort of thing is great because they see, oh, you know, I did something good. You know, I'm a good boy and they'll keep doing it, <laughs> right? That Pavlovian response. People like to feel good. And if you do it for folks like upper level management and the C-suite, they love that even more. You know, if you can convince like your CFO to use a password manager, oh right? Or a password vault. And then you give them a shout out in your monthly security newsletter or whatever, like, oh yeah, the CFO is doing a really good job. You know, it he said it was really easy to set up, et cetera, et cetera. People, first of all, the regular users will be like, oh man, that's cool, corporate uh, upper level buy-in. You know, they're more likely to follow step. And then the CFO feels better because they're like, oh, InfoSec rec recognized that I did a good thing. So you might have made a friend or an ally, right? Someone who's willing to step up and help you with one of your initiatives further on. 
And another thing about that is, you know, we need to foster better relationships with the rest of the organization. Um, I have another example of, you know, user awareness doing done right. So my dad, he just retired from a veterans hospital working there 20 years, uh, IT. So he's very familiar with this stuff too. He's a webmaster, or was a web, webmaster. And he's used to getting tons of emails with requests to update this web page. Here's a document with some specs, et cetera, et cetera. He doesn't even read the emails anymore. He just opens it up, right? Because it has to be done now, now, now. Well, one of these times, he double-clicked the attachment and Windows didn't pop up. So he had that, like, oh shit moment, <laughs> right? And so his first reaction was to unplug from the network. He shut down his box and then he went to the CISO's office and said, hey, I just did this. I unplugged from the network. Uh, what should I do next to take care of this? And what they were able to do is very quickly get him to IT, fill out an incident report, and then flash his machine. And it stopped it dead in his tracks. So he didn't get reprimanded for opening the attachment. He got applauded for coming to the InfoSec office and doing the right thing, according to policy. As it should. I mean, he should, there should have been an accommodation. So another thing, one of the things that we talk about, we talk a little bit about the fishing, fun-filled fishing expedition that I got caught into, um, and how I did mention that I spoke to my supervisor immediately. Full disclosure, da 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 this happened, I clicked. Something that doesn't, that gets overlooked a lot is information sharing. A lot of people will receive, uh, when you get that big flashing red light, if you fail or if you've fallen for one of your phishing tests, uh, don't share this information with your colleagues. Don't tell anyone else on your team. I do not believe that this is appropriate behavior. We're a social beat, you know, we're social beasts. For us to be able to share, hey look, warning, I know you're probably scrolling through your emails on your phone, don't click this, is important to do. Share that information with your team, share it with your peers. It goes towards awareness all across the board. I understand in a testing scenario that might be a little bit, that you might get some pushback. It's just something that I think you need to do anyways. That's my opinion, I'm sticking to it. Another example of sharing information is when we go back a few weeks ago, I think it was the first week of May, with the Google Docs fun-filled sharing thing where people were going ahead and sharing out documents and uh, for on Google Docs. Google was great. They, I mean, they got a mitigation in place almost you know within 30 minutes of being aware of the scenario. But in the meantime, I don't know if any of you guys were stuck on this little loop. I was on group text messages with my family. I was on the phone call with my sister. What is Google Docs? What is Google Docs? I did, I've used this before, but what do I do? What's happening? Am I infected? You know, do I have this infection now, as they would put it? And being able to walk them through. Sharing information, once again, with not only your peers, with your family members, and making security a part of everyday, it's your part of your everyday life. That's kind of the goal. When we're teaching our users, we want them to take the information that they're learning, we hope, and go ahead and use it in their everyday lives. So these are our failures and our successes. You guys have more stories probably very similar or even different from those, and we're gonna talk about those later. But the next step is to figure out, okay, what do we do? How do we make it right? It's easy enough to say either don't do user awareness or we're doing it wrong, but it's another thing entirely to figure out how we can go about doing it correctly or mo better, right? So <laughs> it's like building a house, right? We gotta start with a foundation, and then we have to move up from there. With so, plans. start with plans. Yeah, right. Plans. And one of the first things we have to do is identify, okay, whose job is this? The roles, rules, and responsibilities, right? And what we tend to overlook in security is that it's not just our job. It should be the job of every single person to not only be aware of the policies, but how to better protect themselves. And it's our job to kind of give them the tools and knowledge to do that. And what's, so what's difficult is in InfoSec, we're not seen as a legitimate source of authority, right? They see us as the cops or, you know, folks who are wait, waiting to rat them out. Or the blockers or, from the development team. They can't get anything done because security is covering all these restrictions against them. Right, so what so we that. need is to have more buy-in from folks that they see as legitimate authority figures. So what do I mean by that? Well, 
how many of you are familiar with the 1970s uh, Milgram's experiment on obedience? All right, so a couple of you, right? Uh, for those who aren't aware, in the 1970s, this uh, guy named Milgram, he set up a experiment where he had an actor pretend to be the student and then another person be the participant. And whenever the student got an answer wrong, they had to increase the levels of shock that they delivered to the student. And they would act scared, uh, like it really hurt, but the people kept doing it because the doctor was there telling them to do it, right? And then in the 1980s, a group of folks took this a step further and put it into a business environment. And they took a group of college kids, handed them the same stack of resumes, and split them up into three different groups. The first group was the control group, so they got no further instruction. The second group got a letter from the CEO, or I'm sorry, the CFO, saying, hey, this is for the HR department. It's predominantly white, middle class, male uh, department, and we want to kind of keep with the culture so people get along easily. And then the third group got that memo plus another memo that said, hey, this is the COO, we fired the CFO because of shady business practices, right? So the memos were fake, it was a fake uh, situation, but the participants didn't know this. The first group demonstrated zero bias because they received no further instruction. The second group was more likely to choose white male resumes. And then the third group was closer to the first group because they no longer saw that CFO as a legitimate authority figure. So what, how we can apply that to InfoSec, right, is we get buy-in from not just upper level management like the C-suite, but we also get buy-in from their direct managers. Because if we tell them, oh, don't install ActiveX or JavaScript, you know, don't download this game from Facebook, if they see their managers doing it, they might follow policy for a little bit, but after a while they'll be like, well, everybody else is doing it, so why not? So by having it down at their level, they'll see it more and they'll follow that example better. Um, let's see. All right, so this just plays all into the fact that it's all of our jobs, okay? The idea that security is everybody's job needs to be communicated and reinforced on a regular basis, not just during that annual training, right? We need to send out that newsletter. Have uh, different managers speak on the newsletter, right? Like how they did well, how they um, exhibited the policy, okay? Because it should be our responsibility to tell the business how it can be more secure using the methods that are in line with the business and we'll have support and buy-in from, from all levels of management. I know it's easy, it sounds easier said than done, right? It's gonna be a long and arduous process, but there's several different ways that we can make it easier on ourselves. And one of these ways is to um, use marketing. And Cindy's right. gonna talk on that. So I, if anybody in this room does not recognize our friendly gecko there, I would be very surprised. You probably have already gone through the tagline in your head, save 15% 15, 15 or more. Um, oh, well, yeah, there's the Canadians too. Thank you, thank you. Okay, 15 minutes, thank you. So that marketing worked, okay. So what if you guys had, what if your information security program actually had its own gecko? What if every time you saw some mascot, and we'll just call him gecko for now because it's easy to remember and we've already got that in our heads, what if you saw that gecko on posters with really minor reminders, small, low key, or big? It doesn't matter. But going ahead and getting that information out to the individuals, repetitively being seen, visual cue, using visual cues on an ongoing best basis to trigger various responses. We want to go ahead and instill proper behavior, what we consider proper secure behaviors, right? Associating these mascots with the individuals and with the individual concepts that we've pushed through the training. So building up these, this teamwork, you know, you, you, when you're building up this team, you're bringing in your marketing team, you're seeing these geckos all over the place. You can do everything. You, got, you can put posters up. You can you know, reward behavior by having custom Amazon gift cards created for $5. Whatever the case may be, it's not difficult to go ahead and implement this aspect of it. 
and it keeps it constantly in line of sight. It's a constant reminder. So it's really useful in that regard. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so basically, not, so not only do you think about, where's, we had some snorties floating around here yesterday. Um, think about snorty. So you've got snorty, you've got snorty, maybe you have a snorty on your desk. And it's, you know, once again, require, you know, causing the, you know, suggested response, you're immediately thinking of snort. Cool. You have this, now you have this gecko in your hand. You have a squeeze toy. Well, that squeeze toy, it might sit on your desk for a while. You might bring it home for your kids. And once again, that's once again just going ahead and brainwashing, for lack of a better term, desired behaviors into your organization. And it taking them, going ahead and reinforcing that when they bring it home, reinforcing it with the families. What's this for, mom? It's a good question. And it gets asked. And it sounds gimmicky, and it is, and that's okay, it's right? Totally gimmicky. It's cheesy, <laughs> but we love it because it's been proven to work. So um, again, back to my previous employer, when I was doing PCI stuff, we also did social engineering engagements. And for one client, uh, it was a statewide bank chain, and at the when they first contacted the company, our company, they were like, okay, uh, we want you to call 16 people from different departments and ask them to change their password to one that you choose to see if they did it. So we did, and we got almost all 16 in the first go, right? But what was interesting was the CISO's response. What they did was they used that information to change how they delivered and um, how, what they covered for their user awareness. They didn't fire them, they didn't chastise them, they used it as a training opportunity. And then the next year, slightly fewer people changed their password. And then the next year, even fewer. Until one point when I called 16 folks, only three changed their password. And one of those people put me on hold to call the InfoSec folks to tell them what was happening. So that's great, right? Because we're showing them that it's okay to fail as long as you respond in a way that makes sense and helps you know, um, respond to the attack quicker. So we talked about roles, rules and responsibilities, marketing. Now we need to talk about, okay, what about the framework? How are we setting this thing up? Because our current method, the way it stands, isn't really ideal. It, it's treated as a one size fits, fits all situation, right. but it, it's not, right? So. Right. Computer-based training, right? So computer-based training is what is what we're seeing the most commonly. It's the most easily injected into an organization. Um, it will go ahead and, and nine times out of ten seamlessly integrate with a learning management system that maybe or may, may not already be in place, um, or it could be you know cloud operated and let everybody else you know do as a service. Um, the problem that we see a lot is that this training takes place in a single set, sitting. People giving up an hour to an hour and a half, potentially two hours of their time to sit in front of a timed video presentation with maybe one, two, multiple choice questions throughout the course of this hour and a half, the two hour segment, that's not effective. It's just, it's, it's a pain, yeah, it sucks, it does, it's horrible. Right. And the majority of us, I don't know about you guys, but me personally, I I'll click all the way thing. to the end. If you can. Or like let it play <laughs> in the background and go like do dishes or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, it's not, it's Because not, the answers don't change. No, they don't. And the questions usually don't. It's like doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like doing the online driver's education training and you wish you could click through, but you can't and you're just stuck there. And so you're sitting there doing something else off to the side yeah. and that's exactly what people are doing. What the more effective means of presenting information um, would be doing it in small chunks and doing it on an ongoing basis. Based upon the number of people who come up to people in their cubes and have side conversations for five minutes here, three minutes there, breaking down your security awareness training into small seven to 10 minute chunks is more likely to get some kind of reaction for there to be some kind of retention and maybe not an eagerness to take part in it, but you won't have the dread and they won't be running away, right? They're not gonna be like, oh, I gotta do this again. 
they might say, all right, 10 minutes, I can do that. Not a problem. It's not taking too much of their time. And it does encourage a little bit more retention. Because you're going ahead and be, be having this performed on an ongoing basis, you have seven minutes here. If you have time to take another course, go ahead, take another course. But just know that next month, you got to do another one. But it's seven minutes. It's not a problem. It's reinforcing this. It's helpful in that regard. And we're not solely demonizing computer-based yeah. training because in-person training, in training has its own drawbacks, right? You get a large group of folks, like probably about this size, in an auditorium. They're pretending to listen. They might be updating their Facebook or chatting to one another on Skype or Slack, right? But when we present the information, they have a question. A lot of times, folks in a large setting like this are afraid to ask a question because they don't want to seem dumb. Like, oh, what if everybody else in the room already knows this? Or what if they said it and I wasn't paying attention? Right. I don't want to just the same thing they just said. How embarrassing. And we can't just assume that they're going to come up to us later because a lot of times either they're really not paying attention or, you know, some of them are well-meaning and take notes, but then they get back to their desk and they have to respond to like 20 emails and their boss needs this and they have to print out a TPS report and then bruise my hand. Um, <laughs> so... It has its drawbacks too. There's no one perfect solution. What we need is more of a hybrid model. Absolutely. Yeah. And a, com a good combination that works is when you're going ahead. And for general user awareness, um, for the majority of topics out there, if you're just providing them policy information, things along those lines that meld into your you know, learning man management system, going ahead and doing that through the CBT. Still recommending that seven to 10 minute stretches. Don't, don't stretch it past that because you're going to lose your audience. Um, but going ahead and in addition to that, having training for specialized information, going ahead and holding those in person. Um, your IT team, they are aware of the latest threats and how it could possibly affect the organization that they're a part of, right? Bring, bring them into a more, a more comfortable space to go ahead and be able to address this and having a one-on-one -on -one communication. Smaller groups are always better. Right, and then we also need to take into account what we cover in these trainings, right? So maybe in the larger setting, we want to just cover acceptable use or our general InfoSec policy uh, for our executives and our and their admins. We might want to talk about vishing. Right, absolutely. And you want to talk more on that? Yeah, so I don't know if uh, people, I, it struck me because I remember having a great app on my phone a while back. It was the voice imitator, the voice changing software. I loved playing with that. Um, Adobe back in November came up with Voco and it's an open beta now. You can sign up for the beta test. What it does, it's Photoshop voices. It can listen to a person's voice for 20 minutes. It, it print, imprints that voice pattern and can then change anything typed into the system into, and go ahead and display it in that voice pattern. That's horrifying, right? That's, I mean, that's, that's scary. Because you sit there and you have various mechanisms to go ahead and have in place to, you know, only if, only if you have voice, you know, you've spoken to me directly, do you take these actions, right? And this is part of their training, but now we've got this horror, I mean, it's kind of an amazing tool. Okay, let's face it, we all kind of cool. think it's sexy as heck, but oh my gosh, the repercussions that come alongside with it are, are absolutely horrifying. So what we do recommend in that regard, so one of the things we recommend in that regard is the, um, to go ahead and like maybe set up passphrases. Uh, different organizations do it different ways. Think about when you call your bank nowadays, they might ask you for a security password that you have set up. I have a most, the most ridiculous security password in the world, but I will never forget it. I don't know how often I've changed it, but that's besides the point. Um, the <laughs> <laughs> That's funny we'll because later. I That's asked exactly her the same thing she the did. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so having security phrases set up to go ahead, have that for your users, have that for your administrative assistants, for you know, higher ups who have administrative assistants who will go ahead and take requests from them. Because when you have something like voice requests that are coming across that sound to be the individual you think you're talking to and they turn out not to be, how horrifying is that? I mean, you've just fallen for a pretty complex attempt at social engineering. It happens. Yeah. And that's a great example of specialized training just for the high value targets. But there's other stuff we can consider for our general user space. So clean desk, you know, that's pretty common. Everybody should know about clean desk, even though it's boring and not sexy at all. There's, you know, um, tailgating, like our stories before. And then also talk about social media. 
a lot of people don't realize that they shouldn't accept a random request from LinkedIn because they're like, oh, it's just LinkedIn. I, I don't put my phone number on there. My birthday's not on there. All they'll be able to see is my position and my company. And they don't get why that's important, especially since the rest of their stuff, their Facebook, their Twitter, et cetera, has, oh, going on vacation for a week. Well, if I know that and I'm on your LinkedIn and I know your position, I can pretend to be you on vacation. I need VPN access for whatever reason, right? They don't consider these things. So it's important for us to train on it. Um, a, a good example of uh, how this was done was I used to do IT for a major um, aerospace and defense company, and they had a very strict rule about no pictures and no blogging about what you hear or see here. And they were so strict about it that a contractor who was doing help desk got fired because while they were on the road, they saw a prototype, they stood off property, took a picture, and posted on an um, aviation forum, next day they were fired. So we don't necessarily recommend that fierce of a response, <laughs> but it did reinforce to everybody else like, oh hey, even if I'm not on work hours and I'm not on the company property, they're, they're not messing around, right? right? Other people that we need to go ahead and talk about is uh, technical folks, um, specialty training for technical folks. We all know the development shop, okay, the reality is that a lot of development shops do not reach, I don't even know how to say it, they don't get training, they don't do anything, and half of them don't even talk, don't even know what a wasp is. You know, just the very basics from a security perspective and understanding how to produce secure code. Not just good practices, but secure code. That doesn't happen. And to ensure that this is something that they could be made aware of, and it really can just be an awareness thing. You don't have to hold these classes in your organization. In the case of OWASP, you're really lucky because these guys love going out to organizations and having, you know, let's do a lunch and learn out there and stuff. So that's beneficial, but that doesn't happen often enough. Your IT folks, the, the system, uh, system administrators, getting them specialized training, it's available. It's out there. There are a number of organizations who follow not only the seven to 10 minute rule, that also have very specialized um, modules for these uh, training events. And we all know about security training because security people need to be trained and that's why you guys come to places like this. And it's not to drink with your friends, right? Not it's just all. to <laughs> gain more knowledge and be better. <laughs> um, so now that we're aware of all of this stuff, how do we know it's working? Well, we can do the common stuff. We can do phishing. We can do social engineering calls. My personal favorite is USB sticks because people love drama. If you leave a USB stick like kind of sticking out under a vending machine, I'm not going to do that hand motion again, um, sticking out <laughs> under a vending machine, they'll think someone dropped it and they're going to tell themselves, oh yeah, I'm just going to plug it in so I can return it to the right person. But in reality, they want some drama. They want to see something um, that they shouldn't be seeing on that USB stick. So it's easy to get them to click and open up anything. Um, so it's important to perform these tests regularly and to give them feedback. So what we want to do first of all is to kind of get a baseline. We can say, okay, here is where we at right now. You can break it up uh, based on department, the organization as a whole, what have you. But then what we need to do is be like, okay, our next training, we had a downward trend, or maybe you had an upward trend. Why is that? Metrics. Oh yeah. Metrics. Metrics. We like Met metrics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> People like metrics. Management likes metrics. Upper level management Upper level loves me their pie charts. They do, and it's, it's effective means of going ahead and supporting your programs and going ahead and, and, and the reality is pushing your initiatives. You wanna go ahead and have additional training provided to individuals who may who have demonstrated the need to receive as such than going ahead and having those metrics available developing that baseline if you don't have a solid information or security awareness training program in place do a couple of tests beforehand get that baseline from the very beginning show the value of having putting into place that security awareness program like Meg was saying, do it on a departmental basis, on small groups within the, with the, within the department. You know, however you want to do it, but go ahead and get some solid details so you can see how effective your training is. And that's a big important step. 
And don't stop just there, right? So yeah, we can see the um, failures and successes when we do phishing engagements and stuff like that, but also reach out to your users after training. Be like, hey, what did you think of this module? Yeah. How could we make it better? Was it, did it stick? Do you like these newsletters we're sending? Are they useful to you? Stuff like that. And then also talk to them. You know, it helps if we empathize with our user base because not only will we teach them secure um, practices at work, they're going to take that at home. home. And then they might teach their parents or uh, their kids this stuff. So when they enter the workforce, our job's a little bit easier. Absolutely. Um, another thing we need to make sure to cover is the ability to stay on top of upcoming trends. You think back, um, when was the first ransomware attack? I mean, that was publicly acknowledged. I mean, it, it was like fast and hard. That just came in, right? I mean, all of a sudden, ransomware's a thing, right? Whether or not that was addressed immediately within your organizational's uh, security awareness training, if it was addressed at all, until maybe the following year or the year after that, that's that's important. You need to bring awareness to situations and potential you know vectors of attack. You need to make your users aware of this stuff. Um, by util by leveraging that that modular perspective, those, a seven minute module, a training module, is a heck of a lot easier to get produced than inserting something into a full hour and a half training nightmare. <laughs> so. I would, that's one of the things we need to do is be able to incorporate all this new information that's coming out all the time, all these new threat models, all these things that people just basically need to have awareness into. You know, it's, it's like, you know, when you were a kid, you learned to look both ways when you cross the street. Okay, so start from that pr perspective when you're going ahead and building things out and be able to add on new things as they're exposed to more and more things. It does get easier over time. It might suck really, 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 really hard when you first start, but over time, it does get better. And a way with that we can do better is to talk with one another. It's, it doesn't have to be like your secret sauce, how you approach user awareness. It's something that we can bring to our next company. We can talk to each other at conferences. Uh, you don't have to say your company name if you're paranoid and shit, so that's fine. <laughs> um, it's, it's also kind of like what Jason said in his talk yesterday. It's not our job to determine when we fail, right? When, when to give up. It's, you know, it's the business's job to say, okay, this is when it's defeat. So we need to keep trying and constantly improving ourselves. And one way uh, that we can do that is by sharing stories. So again, I want to open this up right now. If you have any questions, feel free to add us on Twitter. Uh, again, Totenkopf, Cinders and Ashes, and that's our email. Um, so yeah, anybody want to share a success story of user awareness in their organization? I want to hear, we really would love to hear additional positive stories and how this has actually worked out for you guys, so. And it doesn't have to be your current company either. It yeah. can be something you heard of or used to work at. So this is Wow, sad. this is bleak. Yeah. You guys are like, it all Okay, sucks. come on. Let's, can somebody, microphone? Yeah. Thank you. I was like, I was about to get sad. <laughs> So I've actually got a friend who's a CISO at a Fortune 100 company, and so he's got a you know a secret insider program, uh, and so he picks one employee out of the company a week to come into work without their badge, and the first employee that stops nice. them gets a hundred dollar gift certificate to take their family out to dinner. That's spectacular! Yeah. What a great reinforcement of behavior. I mean, it and doesn't it's, have to be a hundred bucks. And the, yeah. <laughs> the the beauty about that is it's not just that. The employee gets to celebrate, but they get to celebrate with their family. So the family's great. really proud of them as well. And they get to tell the story and how they got it. And it's just once once again, you're reinforcing behaviors. And that's spectacular. But that's great. That's great. That's, that's exactly a great story. what we're looking for. OK, I know there's got to be more positives out there. Come on. All right. All right. Caspian's got one. Here. Here we go. So in a prior incarnation, I used to work at a large Canadian university. You guys all know this because we work together. Just, just so we're clear, I work with them. Um, He's a plant. <laughs> full disclosure, I'm a plant. We needed uh, one. We only got one. And we, we had a huge problem. We, we had a 35,000-person student body with staff, another 10,000 staff or so. And we had a huge problem with security awareness overall. We had you know, heavily siloed everything. Uh, and what I started doing when I got there, it was my job to do incident response and run the antivirus systems. What I started doing was sending out emails on roughly a weekly basis with just a summary of all of the major threats we saw this week. 
And by year number three, I had people coming back to me saying, oh yeah, I've been reading your emails. This is really cool. What can I do about it? And by year number five, I didn't have anybody coming back to me anymore. They were all already saying, okay, so I've told all these other people about this. And, you know, we, we took that one thing where we sent you back a, an email, you know, if you would buy us a coffee. So here's the answer. Will you buy us a coffee? So I spent a lot of money buying people coffee. Uh, okay. But the upside was by the end of it, we had a whole bunch of very secure departments that were dealing with things like, oh, I don't know, psychological data, uh, you know, medical imaging metrics, uh, stuff like that. And they all became very aware of it very quickly once I started talking to them. But if I just sat behind my desk, and there were a couple right. of months, I, and I remember this, there were a couple of months where I was told, okay, you can't send out any more of these emails, you're too busy, you got to do too much. And so I would sit back. And we notice the infection delta just go up, right? And everything would just start failing. And we get these professors calling and be like, "I, I used a USB key that one of my students gave me, and now the entire lab has blinking lights on the screens." So we could see where it would stop and start. And when I went back to the uh, the executive with this, they went, "Okay, keep doing it." Right. In fact, we're going to start doing it more. Can we start like an awareness campaign? And of course, that was around the time that I quit the job. <laughs> see, and I was just going to ask if you had a Tim Hortons on campus because that would make just providing the coffee okay. much easier. Right. Okay, just want to make sure. So that also reminds me, um, I don't know how many of you listen to Southern Pride Security Podcast. Well, uh, in one episode, Martin Fisher, um, armor guy, <laughs> I almost said uncle armor guy, um, <laughs> went on the show and he's like, well, at one point, our organization took away the free coffee for everybody. So what he did was on his own penny, bought like a Keurig and stocked it with coffee and then other people from other teams would come over and be like, hey, can I have some of your coffee? And they'd just like put a quarter in or whatever. And while they were making their coffee, would sit and be forced to talk to the InfoSec team. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't, I don't know if that was his purpose. I think it was just to give his guys coffee. But it worked out. Worked so they it. didn't see them as this weird group who kind of like hit off in the corner and made nerdy jokes to one another. <laughs> right? So when something did invariably happen, they felt more comfortable going to one of the guys on the team saying, hey, I saw this thing on Facebook, or I clicked this link, or the Google Docs thing happened. What do I do? And it gets that conversation going. Right. And along the same lines, I was working for, I was overseas working for the DOD school system. Um, and I came in, and we had to do the in-person training, which was about two hours of me yammering at people that I didn't know yet. Um, and then afterwards, a lot of the teachers are getting together and they were like, hey, we're going to go out and we're going to go up to uh, Tokyo and check out a sumo, sumo basu. And I was like, this sounds exciting. Do you guys mind if I come along? And they're like, no. And I said, why do you look so surprised? Like, no, you, you have a personality. You're, you're like, it, you're talking to us. Everybody else is, we've never talked to our IT people before. We don't know our security people. So the same kind of lines. I mean, keeping those, get some communication lines open. There's also the other side of that where, now in that environment, this was definitely the case. We're like, hey, Cindy, yeah, let's go hang out. Oh, by the way, I got a problem with my home computer. Can you help me out? So, you know, then you end up with the, no, I will not fix your computer t-shirts and things like that. But it was really beneficial because I was able to share information with them on a much more efficient manner. Yeah. So I think we might have time for like one or two more stories if anyone else has one. Anyone? Bueller? No? Okay. All right. Well, then, thank you guys so thank much you for letting us talk to you. All right. Have a great day. Thanks. Have a great one.